So it's my pleasure to introduce the next panel that uh, begins now. It's called The Jewish Museum Effect. And we have Jeffrey Chandler and Francesca Spaniolo. First, let me introduce Jeffrey Chandler. Jeffrey Chandler, who's sitting right here. Hi, Jeffrey is Professor and Chair of Jewish Studies at Rutgers University. His most recent books include Shtetl, A Vernacular Intellectual History, and Anne Frank Unbound, Media, Imagination, Memory. Jeffrey has served as President of the Association for Jewish Studies and is a Fellow of the American Academy for Jewish Research. Please welcome Jeffrey Chandler. He's going to be joined after he talks by Francesca Spagnolo, and I'm going to introduce Francesco now. Francesca Spagnolo, where are you, Francesco? There you are. Uh, has his PhD uh, from Hebrew University. He's the curator of the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life, our host today, and a lecturer in the Department of Music at the University of California, Berkeley, as well as a host for the cultural programs of RAI Italian National Radio, Rome. A multidisciplinary scholar focusing on Jewish studies, music, and digital media, he intersects textual, visual, and musical cultures, contributing to academic, cultural, heritage institutions, and live and electronic media in Europe, Israel, and the US. And Francesca will be responding to Jeffrey Chandler's presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Laurie, and uh, I'd like to offer uh, my thanks to all the people and institutions involved in putting together this uh, really wonderful symposium, and I'm uh, very honored to be asked to take part in it. And I should explain that my uh, assignment uh, was to offer something that would complement the close focus of the rest of the day on the Polin Museum and on the budget uh, synagogue ceiling uh, by discussing the place of museums in Jewish culture more generally. I will uh, wind up uh, taking us to Poland and to the Pauline Museum uh, at the end. But first, in 1947, the American Yiddish poet Aleph Leilis published a poem called the Gott von Yisrael, the God of Israel, which reads in part, I'll read the Yiddish, then I'll read you an English translation. The Gotham Yisrael is karg. Er will nicht anfielen sein Museum mit Statuen, mit Gemälden, Altaren, Trogschuhen, purpurne Kleider, drei Gorren dicker Kreunen. Er will in kein Palais nicht wohnen. Der jüdische Museum hat winzig paar Scheunen. A Chanukah Lempel, a Paroiches, a Megillah, a Psomimbixel, a Tfilensäckel, a Yad, a Menoire, a Kesseteure, a Machschirren von Mille, und a Farzeitiker, Farfarzeitiker, Xaviad. Noch a manuscript, noch a manuscript, gewickelt, gebunden, verknipped, oisius and oisius verliebt. And in the translation by uh, Benjamin and Barbara Harshav, the God of Israel is stingy. He won't fill his museum with statues, paintings, altars, thrones, purple gowns, three tiered crowns. He does not wish to live in a palais. The Jewish museum has a modest display. A Hanukkah lamp, a curtain, a scroll, a spice box, tefillin, a pointed hand, a menorah, a Torah crown, tools for circumcision, and an old ancient manuscript. And another manuscript, and another manuscript, entangled, bound, locked together, letters in love with letters. Leolis's poem implies that a museum that is a public building displaying splendid works of art and treasures is alien and perhaps inimical to traditional Jewish culture. Rather, the poem suggests the truly prized items of Jewish culture are linguistic and literary, a wealth of manuscripts which are formed, Leolis writes, of two handfuls of letters that the eponymous God of Israel dropped from heaven onto the earth thousands of years ago. Yet at the same time that Leolis wrote this poem in the early aftermath of World War II, Jewish museums were starting to become increasingly important in Jewish life. The divinely inspired devotional grappling with texts that Leolis invokes as the core of traditional Jewish life was in the process of being joined by a newer set of practices centered on Jewish museums. 
establishing them, visiting them, supporting them, discussing them, and eventually integrating their practices of collecting, curating, and displaying works of visual and material culture into Jewish life beyond the confines of these institutions' walls. My talk today considers the museum effect in Jewish life from early encounters in the mid-19th century to the present in Europe, America, and elsewhere, and eventually coming to the Pauline Museum. In my talk, I uh, both adopt and extend the term museum effect. This term is usually used in museum studies either to explain how the act of placing an object in a museum transforms its significance, removing it from one context of meaning, situating it in another, or to discuss the impact that museums have on visitors by dint of the structuring of viewing, thereby shaping the public's encounters with history, science, and culture. I'd like to consider the museum effect as a form of public engagement with museum practices as well as the contents of these institutions and to examine this engagement as a phenomenon of modern Jewish culture. I'm especially interested in the implications of practices in which visitors are not the object of museums' agendas, but rather are the agents of their own engagements with these institutions and their practices. But first, some background. Modern museums are a phenomenon of the Enlightenment, especially in the case of museums open to the public, such as the uh, transformation of the Louvre after the French Revolution, open to the public in 1793. They are rooted in Western principles of democratizing humanistic edification. In addition to making the study of art and science available to the public, museums help to define public life through their instantiation. Consider how this is presented in a painting by Moritz David Oppenheim, who lived from 1800 to 1882, uh, he's often described as the first modern Jewish artist, that is, the first Jewish artist to become a professional, academically trained artist in Western Europe during the 19th century. And uh, I should note that a more famous painting than the one I'm going to show you by Oppenheim can be seen in the gallery just behind this auditorium uh, in, a, in an exhibition that uh, does a, a really uh, fabulous job of deconstructing it. And if you haven't seen it, definitely check this out. But turn your attention to Oppenheim's 1865 painting, Museum Besucher, Museum Visitors. Uh, this painting centers uh, attention on a middle-class woman of the period, accompanied by her young child and a servant, who are, as the title suggests, visiting an art museum. Their central presence in the composition, uh, they're framed by the arch in the background, highlights the role of museums in providing opportunities for bourgeois women to be in the public sphere, independent of their husbands or adult male relatives. The painting's central figures further indicate that these institutions offer the elevating experience of looking at works of fine art to people of all ages, even children, and classes, even servants. The central group of figures is flanked by a man behind him to the right, reading a guidebook about the artworks he is examining. In the foreground on the left, there's a sleeping guard. I think that's just a bit of comic relief. Uh, and in front of him is a self-portrait of Oppenheim in the act of sketching. In a remarkable act of self-reflection, the painting mirrors the contemplating of this canvas back onto museum visitors. So consider that when this painting was first exhibited, viewers were in effect looking at a representation of themselves in the act of doing what they were doing, looking at art. In addition, the artist locates himself in a museum as both a work of art in the form of his self-portrait and as an artist making a sketch for an artwork that, like this painting, might wind up in a museum. Oppenheim's presence in the museum also implies that museums are places where a Jew, such as, as the artist himself, can enter the public sphere and not only encounter ennobling works of Western art, but also contribute to them. In this work, the museum effect is recursive, drawing the viewer into a reflection on the multiple possibilities that museums facilitate, be it enlightenment, the man in the back with his guidebook, wonder, exemplified by the facial expressions of the child and the maid, uh, and creativity in, uh, represented by Oppenheim himself. The Jewish museum effect, whether on objects or people, was relatively limited in scope during the first decades of this phenomenon. Following temporary displays of Judaica at World's Fairs and Expositions, 
uh, such as uh, this uh, photograph from the Anglo-Jewish Historical Exhibition in London in 1887. Uh, uh, and there were other such uh, uh, displays in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, after this, the earliest Jewish museums were established at the turn of the 20th century in major cities in Europe, the first one opening in Vienna in 1896, and in the United States where the first museum was initiated in New York in 1904. Though in 1913, Hebrew Union College's Union Museum uh, was founded in Cincinnati, becoming the first formally established Jewish museum in the United States. Uh, their displays consisted primarily of Jewish ritual objects, books, and manuscripts. That is the modest display uh, of Leah Liss's poem. Within the great expansion of modern Jewish cultural institutions of this period, think of the burgeoning of political organizations and periodicals and corporate philanthropies and theaters and schools and youth movements and so on. You know, all these things that are just exploding in the uh, first decades of the 20th century, Jewish museums were relatively few in number and figured marginally in the making of new Jewish cultural practices. For example, the Jewish Museum in New York, which has since become the largest such museum in the United States, began modestly and also serendipitously when, in 1904, Meyer Sulzberger, who we see here, donated a small number of ritual objects to the library of the Jewish Theological Seminary, along with a much larger and I'm sure much more welcome collection of books and manuscripts. That's what they really wanted. Sulzberger suggested that these objects could serve as the start of a Jewish museum attached to the JTS library. It was his idea, not theirs. At first, this uh, museum consisted of displays in a couple of glass cabinets in the library's reading room. By the 1930s, uh, the museum had a room of its own in the seminary building. But the earliest efforts to make this museum more of a presence at JTS largely met with indifference from the seminary's leadership. Then in 1944, Frida Schiff uh, Warburg donated her Fifth Avenue mansion, which looks like that, to JTS for the purpose of expanding its museum. So once again, the museum impulse is coming not from the leaders of the organization, but basically from wealthy donors. Uh, however, the uh, seminary's chancellor at the time, Louis Finkelstein, suggested that that building could be better used for other purposes. He said maybe classrooms, an interfaith think tank, a research institute. But um, uh, Frida schiff uh prevailed. Since uh, their first appearance at the turn of the century in a few large cities in Europe and the United States, Jewish museums have become a fixture of Jewish culture internationally in the post-World War II era and especially in the last you know, 40, 50 years. Quickly moving from a relatively adventitious presence in Jewish public culture to some of its most prominent fixtures, Jewish museums now attract substantial support from individual donors and foundations and municipal as well as national governments. Visiting Jewish museums has become a mainstay of Jewish practice for local communities as well as tourists. To some extent, this is part of a larger expansion of the number, variety, and salience of museums generally. Still, it is not inevitable that museums would become so important in Jewish life. With the proliferation of Jewish museums has, be, has come an expansion of their variety. Beyond the dozens of museums in big cities that are major centers of Jewish population around the world, Jewish museums are found in places where few, sometimes no Jews, currently live. For example, in Hohenems, Austria, or Casablanca in uh, Morocco, or Girona in Spain. The roster of Jewish museums can embrace institutions with a particular focus. It might be local Jewish history, it might be Holocaust remembrance, it might be contemporary Jewish art, as well as museums in which Jews are part of a diverse mix, such as the uh, Lower East Side Tenement Museum, which exhibits the lives of immigrant Germans and Irish and Italians, as well as Jews who settled in this Manhattan neighborhood between the mid-19th to the uh, uh, early 20th century. Jewish museums can include historic homes and buildings, most famously the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam, as well as former synagogues, such as the Neue Synagoge in uh, um, Berlin's or Jannenburgerstrasse. A number of functioning synagogues have small museums within their buildings. For example, Manhattan's uh, Temple Emanuel. Uh, some synagogues have become historic or architectural landmarks, so in effect, they are visited as artifacts 
or as works of art. Uh, for example, the Beth Shalom Synagogue in Elkins Park, uh, Pennsylvania, this is outside of Philadelphia, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. In addition, Jewish museums sometimes turn up in unusual settings. For example, embedded within a senior citizen's residence. This is the Durfner Judaica Museum in the Hebrew home uh, in Riverdale, New York, or a summer camp. For years, the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience stood on the campus of the Henry S. Jacobs Camp in Utica, Mississippi. So on this map, you see the yellow circle, which I've added there. That shows where the museum was on the campgrounds. It has recently been moved to a nearby uh, town. Though rooted in secular practices, Jewish museums have, have recently been established by members of some Haredi, ultra-Orthodox communities. For example, the Jewish Children's Museum in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Or, and if you're small enough, you two can crawl through a uh, giant challah. Uh, or uh, the Living Torah Museum in Borough Park, Brooklyn, which is basically a, a, a one-man operation, and it's quite, quite something. Uh, <laughs> as, um, you know, it could be a talk unto itself. Uh, as Jewish museums have expanded in number and variety, so has the Jewish museum effect. To some extent, this reflects larger developments in museum practices. So uh, today, many museums invite interactive engagement with exhibitions, eliciting comments from visitors, which then become part of the installation. So uh, an exhibition in the Sydney Jewish Museum on the history of Australian Jewry explains when Jews immigrated there and then invites visitors to contribute information on their own family's immigration histories, which they write on these paper tags and then are displayed on a wall, as you see, you see on the left. The various accounts on display situate Jewish stories within Australia's extensive ongoing history of immigration and demonstrate the museum's significance for a diversity of non-Jewish visitors. The act of writing and displaying one's personal information also implicitly positions visitors within the narrative of Australian Jewish history, whether they're Jewish or not, whether they're Australian or not, as their stories of origin become museum artifacts. Cape Town South African Jewish Museum offers visitors a different interactive practice in its reconstruction of a typical East European shtetl, this is how it's described, which is presented as the point of origin for most Jews in South Africa whose ancestors immigrated there from Lithuanian provinces of the Russian Empire at the turn of the 20th century. The reconstruction deftly merges an enlarged photograph of a street, which was taken at the turn uh, of the century in the town of uh, Ritivas, uh, with a full-scale fabricated facade of buildings and a faux street paved with cobblestones. And this enables visitors to enter, and if they wish, as you see here, to be photographed in a virtual shtetl which hovers between two and three dimensions, sepia and color, the specific and the generic, Eastern Europe and South Africa, past and present. There's a lot going on in this image. <laughs> the photograph records both the visitor's temporary entry into the museum's narrative and their subjunctive journey through time and space to turn of the century Lithuania. Perhaps the most provocative example of self-reflexive interactivity with Jewish museum exhibitions is the so-called Jew in a Box exhibition, presented in the year 2013 at the Jewish Museum Berlin, in which volunteers from the local Jewish community sat in an open, transparent vitrine with the label, gibt es noch Juden in Deutschland? Are there still Jews in Germany? The volunteers answered visitors' questions about Jews and about Judaism, and one of these volunteers, uh, Dekel Peretz, who was then a doctoral student in Jewish-German history in Potsdam, reported that being on display in the museum reflected his experiences as a Jew living in Germany. In a press interview, he explained, in many ways, my everyday life is anyway a bit like living in a box. Your mere presence in a pub triggers debates about the Holocaust or Middle East politics. So I wasn't phased about taking part in the exhibition. Museum professionals variously characterize these interactions as uh, either extending conventional museum practices or as subverting them. Co uh, consider, for example, the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life, in which we find ourselves right now, uh, demonstrates its mission to be what it has termed ooh, there we go, an unmuseum, in part by seeking ways to enable members of the public to engage actively with its collections. 
of its 2015 project entitled The Future of Memory, Jewish Culture in the Digital Age, the Magnus' website explains that this endeavor stages a digital humanities research lab within a museum installation. Objects, books, and documents are displayed, studied, digitized, and published on the web. Online conversations are instigated and monitored, and the results are discussed and analyzed so they can further benefit the long-term study and development of the Magnus collection. Faculty, students, and the public will work closely with museum professionals, interacting with collection artifacts and digital tools, experimenting with new platforms, and providing feedback. The protagonists of this project, the museum writes, are the visitors. Even though the Magnus situates the public as protagonists in this project, it is initiated and supervised by museum staff. Complementing such museum practices are those initiated by members of the public. Consider, for example, the displays of Judaica that are found in many private homes as a domesticated museum practice. These displays recall the Wunderkammer, or cabinet of curiosities, found in the homes of aristocratic and wealthy elites of Western and Central Europe during the early modern period, and which became the, the precursors of the modern museum. The uh, photographer, uh, Peter Levy, documented some of these uh, domestic displays in his 1997 book, Yiddishes, or, or Jewishness, uh, and they variously include ritual objects, figurines, photographs, medals, jewelry, paintings, books. So once again, we have Leolis's modest display. The items are typically arrayed in cabinets, in vitrines, or on mantles, sometimes end tables, home furnishings that are meant for display. And when it turns out that some of these objects of domestic Judaica were reproductions that were purchased in museum gift shops, their movement is recursive. <laughs> the domestic display evoking or even mirroring on a small scale museum exhibitions. Similar displays can be seen in videos of Holocaust survivors filmed by the Shoah Visual History Archive, as these interviews were usually conducted in survivors' homes. Survivors are often filmed before an array of emblematic items, such as books or family photographs or ritual objects. In addition, survivors were provided the opportunity to include in the videos a record of material artifacts of their lives. Photographs, such as we see here, clothing, ritual objects, tools, jewelry, weapons, and so on. And some of these items are distinct relics of the Holocaust, such as uh, yellow Jewish badges in the shape of the Star of David, or uh, uh, examples of ghetto currency or concentration camp uniforms. But most of these objects appear to be commonplace, neither readily distinguished as artifacts of the Holocaust nor inherently singular in some other way. Rather, through the stories that they prompt, these ordinary objects can become extraordinary relics of epical events. Kept and maintained for decades after the war, these objects also evince survivors' sense of history, whether personal or on a grand scale, and its materialization. As ordered arrangements of selected discrete items, the sequences of personal objects filmed for these videos constitute impromptu virtual exhibitions. The survivor in the role of curator provides information that identifies and contextualizes objects and can impart added meaning to these items through their ordering and juxtaposition. In addition, the survivor functions as a docent during the videotaping, guiding viewers from object to object, directing their attention to particular details, and offering interpretations of the item's significance. As museums have become fixtures of many Jewish communities, local populations often develop proprietary relationships with these institutions. Community members may not only feel that they have a claim on these institutions, but also act on this sentiment. For example, by volunteering to work in museums as docents or greeters or educators or fundraisers. This proprietary relationship with Jewish museums is also reflected in more routine practices, such as the messages that visitors write in comment books that are provided at the ends of many exhibitions, often leaving remarks that are more about affirming their feelings about Jewishness than about the exhibitions per se. And there are less amicable outcomes from this sense of proprietary rights as well. Most notably, protests of exhibition that members of Jewish communities regard as contrary to their sense of the museum's purpose. This can result in a museum shutting down an exhibition, as happened with uh, imaginary coordinates in 2008 at the Spertus Museum in Chicago, or it may prompt a museum to address these concerns from the public by speaking to the press 
and adjusting the exhibition and its attendant programming, as was the case in the Jewish Museum of New York's 2002 exhibition, Mirroring Evil, Nazi Imagery and Recent Art, which drew public protests even before it had opened. Jewish museums respond to these proprietary impulses by seeking ways to make Jewish visitors feel at home in these institutions. For example, by offering special programs on December 25th, thereby addressing concerns for a Jewish sense of alienation on Christmas. Other occasions, on other occasions, Jewish museums open their doors to the public to make a political statement. Following a terrorist, terrorist shooting at the Brussels Jewish Museum in 2014, the Jewish Museum in Rome invited the public to visit. This is a picture of them with streams of visitors coming in. Uh, and to do so as a gesture of solidarity with the Brussels Museum and as an act, in their words, of defiantly using culture against terror. Conversely, Jewish museums sometimes make themselves at home, uh, Jewish museum goers, sometimes make themselves at home in these institutions on their own terms, even incorporating the museum in personal ritual activity. For example, Philadelphia's National Museum of American Jewish History has an extensive collection of contemporary American ketubot, or Jewish marriage contracts, all individually crafted works inscribed by hand and richly decorated. In the 1990s, the museum in its old building, it's since opened a new building, uh, displayed a selection of these uh, ketubot on a wall leading from the building's foyer to the museum offices. It looks something like this. I, I recreated this uh, th just to give you a sense of uh, what I was looking at. Um, and uh, I, I found them very interesting, and I, I uh, discussed them with Margot Bloom, who was then the museum's director. Um, and uh, it was very interesting, you know, when I, I said, you know, really kind of interesting, she sort of made a face, she said, oh, you know, we have so many more of these things in storage, I don't even know what we're going to do with them all. And I thought that was kind of a remarkable way for a, 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 a the director of a museum to talk about their holdings, you know, and uh, <laughs> like they, they were kudzu, you know, out of control. <laughs> And I said, well, how, how did you get all of these things? And she sort of stared at me like I'm an idiot. And she said, think about it, Jeffrey. And I thought about it, and I'm an idiot. I had no idea. And she said, come on, half of all marriages end in divorce. <laughs> all right, so you didn't think of it either. OK, good. Um, and she said, when these couples break up, they don't know what to do with these two boats. Um, they spend hundreds of dollars on them. They displayed them in frames in their living room. Now nobody wants it. So they donate the ketubah to our museum, and they get a tax deduction in return. <laughs> so this is like totally just stopped me in my tracks. Because when I'm looking at this display, which looked like this, you know, I thought I'm looking at a display of the vitality and creativity associated with the wedding, you know, a life cycle celebration widely regarded as a fundament of Jewish life. And of course, you know, what Jewish museum doesn't do that, you know? In fact, I'm looking at a gallery of broken marriages. <laughs> Moreover, these uh, ketubot became part of the museum's holdings by dint of members of the Jewish public who in effect have repurposed the museum, turning it into a repository for these unwanted artifacts. Divorced couples' donation of their ketubot to this and other Jewish museums, this isn't the only place where it happens, uh, might, this act might be regarded as a way to transform the significance of these documents, which once served to materialize the couple's commitment to one another, and they do so through a new self-styled rite of popular religion. With this act, a couple's relationship to the ketubah changes as the marriage it concerns comes undone. Donating the document to a Jewish museum might be understood as a symbolic gesture of locating the complex interrelations that the ketubah had brought together and which are now sundered within a venue that renders the document and perhaps the marriage that it represents an artifact of communal history and culture. This gesture evinces a desire in its own right for validating Jewish continuity, if not by celebrating an idealized image of marriage, then by recognizing divorce as a part of Jewish life. Donating Ketubo to a museum following divorce, as opposed to destroying them or relegating to the attic or depositing them in a, a Geniza, which is a traditional repository for uh, old sacred texts, may also evince desires to validate Jewish continuity through participation in a public form of Jewish visual culture with the museum understood as a communal keeper of cultural relics. 
So as museums become an increasingly familiar presence in the public sphere, the museum effect, understood as the transformative impact that museums have on objects or on visitors, expands beyond the unilateral movement of this effect from these institutions outward. Examples of recent museum practices in contemporary Jewish life demonstrate how museum goers have taken the museum effect home with them, how they have found ways to make themselves at home in the museum, and how they have sometimes redirected the agency of the museum effect, asserting their own valuations of the role of Jewish museums onto the institutions themselves. Well, what sort of Jewish museum effect takes place in the Polin Museum? As I told you, we'd get there. When Warsaw's Museum of the History of Polish Jews opened last year, it joined an expansive range of sites and events throughout the country that produce experiences of Jewish Poland for visitors. And they include music and cultural festivals, intensive educational programs, art installations, guided tours of cemeteries, death camps, pre-World War II Jewish neighborhoods, and visitors' ancestral hometowns. These sites of Polish Jewish experience dominate the nation's Jewish landscape, more visible uh, and involving more people than does Jewish life as led by the thousands of Jews residing in Poland. To understand the museum effect of the Poland Museum, it must be considered within this larger context of instantiating sites of Polish Jewish experience. So let's consider another example of the Jewish museum effect in Poland as manifest in the building that once housed the Yeshivas Chochme Lublin, established by Rabbi Meyer Shapiro in 1930. During World War II, the German army seized the building, stripped it of its furnishings, and burned its library in public. After the war, the Polish government took possession of the building and designated it as a facility for the Medical University of Lublin. The building was subsequently returned to Poland's Jewish community in 2004. The synagogue that had been housed inside the original yeshiva was restored to its pre-war condition and open to visitors as a historic site. That's what it looks like. A 2010 report on the building's partial restoration explained the plans uh, to continue renovations were underway, as were discussions of the site's future use. These included not only creating a center for the city's small Jewish community, but also transforming the former yeshiva into a site for an experience of Jewish Poland a museum of Hasidism, perhaps, or a hotel that could serve as a base for those touring Jewish-related sites in Poland. In 2014, the former yeshiva building was reopened as the four-star Hotel Ilan. The hotel's logo features a stylized tree, which of course the meaning of the Hebrew word Ilan, sprouting from the last letter of the word hotel, beneath which appears the English tagline, feel the tradition. <laughs> The hotel's website explains that the building, once the largest and most prestigious rabbinical school in the world, is now a place where Jewish tradition is combined with the highest quality and standard, uh, presumably of hotel accommodations, uh, not rabbinical instruction. The hotel's restaurant serves, and again from the website, an amazing synergy of traditional Polish and Jewish cuisine, which the menu reveals isn't kosher, and guests can explore the synagogue and mikveh at no extra charge. There's a restored mikveh. Near the synagogue, this, this, this room here, is a text panel on a wall that outlines a typical day's program for yeshiva students in the 1930s. Visitors to the Hotel Ilan do not follow this program, of course. Rather, they read about it and perhaps imagine it as they explore the building's restored spaces and thereby feel the tradition. Given the scope and salience of the Polin Museum, it is poised to become the keystone in the arch of Polish Jewish experience. So how might the museum effect inspire visitors to reflect on the contemporary phenomenon of Polish Jewish experience as both something that is distinct from and at the same time is related to the history of Jewish life in Poland, an ongoing history, I, I should add. Consider the possibilities of doing so with regard to what has become the museum's signature display, and which we have uh, talked a lot about today already, so I don't have to explain what it is, and that is the reproduction of the ceiling of the Gwodzic Synagogue. The ceiling is as much an artifact of contemporary experience of Jewish Poland as it is of Jewish life in 18th century Poland, if not more so. 
The museum facilitates the visitor's awareness of this distinction by displaying not only the uh, recreated ceiling, but also a reconstruction of the beams that held up the original ceiling beneath the synagogue's pitched roof. Protruding above the floor on which the museum's core exhibition is located, the roof beams are encountered on the building's entry level. And, and in fact, this is something that visitors can see before entering the core exhibition proper, where, where you get to see the, the ceiling. Uh, this view, uh, well, I should show you, that's the roof uh, sticking above the, um, the roof beam sticking above the ceiling. Uh, protruding, um, yes, this view calls attention to the process of fabricating this replica by Hans House Studio, which we've uh, had a, a wonderful presentation about. Uh, and uh, as we've heard, the, the Hans House project engendered a really, uh, just absolutely remarkable experience of Jewish Poland for hundreds of participants who spent weeks of their lives uh, hewing timbers with vintage hand axes, mixing paints according to 300-year-old recipes. And this project, which the museum explains on panels adjacent to the display of the roof beams, these panels that you see on the, on the side here, exemplifies new ways of engaging the Polish Jewish past within an experience of the present. What visitors encounter, um, well, this is the Hans House project. I'm sorry, I'm one slide behind. Uh, this is w one of the groups, this one in Wroclaw. Uh, uh, doing their, their part of uh, the reconstruction. What visitors encounter in this display is both less than and more than what the Jews of Gwodziec would have seen generations ago when worshiping in their synagogue. On one hand, the reproduced ceiling is a fragment of the entire building, and it's slightly smaller than the size of the original. Visitors are most likely to see it only once, for several minutes, in the course of their tour of the museum's many rooms. On the other hand, during that relatively brief time, museum goers are able to view the ceiling's elaborate polychrome decoration more clearly than did the worshippers centuries ago, as the reproduced ceiling is illuminated with electric lighting. Information in Polish and English explaining the ceiling's iconography and the many Hebrew inscriptions is provided in the gallery. Moreover, museum visitors' ability to see both the ceiling and the roof beams is something only the builders of the original synagogue would have ever had the opportunity to see. Hans House uh, Studio's replica of the Gwodziec Synagogue ceiling now serves as a triple artifact. It recalls the ascetics of an 18th century Jewish devotional space in provincial Poland. It manifests a contemporary experience of Jewish Poland, which is centered not on worship, but on vintage artisanal skills. And it serves as a tacit reminder that the original synagogue was destroyed during World War II, emblematic of the Holocaust devastation of Jewish life in Poland. Whereas the original synagogue structure evinces the close symbiosis of Jews and, Poland, Jews and Poles in the period when the building was erected, the museum's recreation of the synagogue's ceiling and roof manifests a new kind of communion around Polish Jewish culture. It's not the ongoing local collaboration of neighbors, but rather a temporary <coughs> gathering of Jews and Poles and others uh, drawn by diverse personal motives to the experience of learning about the Jewish past, the Polish Jewish past, through material practices. So standing under the reconstructed ceiling of the Gwodziec Synagogue, visitors to the Poland Museum might consider how this replica presents one epoch in Polish Jewish uh, Jewry's thousand year history, and at the same time, how the ceiling exemplifies a new era in this chronology, in which experience of a bygone Jewish Poland predominates. Moreover, contemplating this installation might inspire further reflection on the distinctive character of Polish Jewish experience, which the museum itself epitomizes. And finally, it remains to be seen what social practices the Polish Museum, Poland Jew Museum will inspire, whether for local Jews and Poles or for visitors, Jewish or not, whether they're coming from elsewhere in Europe or elsewhere in the world, as the Jewish Museum effect takes shape in this new institution amid this singular Jewish landscape? And this is probably a question that the last speaker today will have what to say about. So with that, I will conclude. Yeah, we can do that. So my students would say that, you know, 
as me responding on the museum effect to a paper about the museum effect about a museum inside a museum is really meta. <laughs> and this is what we're doing today. So uh, let's take stock of that. I'm just, in, in my response, I'm, I'm just going to point to it. This is a fantastic paper, and it goes in, in lots of really, really juicy, interesting directions. So uh, I, I could only choose a few, right? Um, and I, I just wanted to issue a warning, which is that I will be using, and I hope nobody's going to be offended in my, in my response, two words that usually are uh, adopted in a ne with a negative connotation. Uh, one is the word kitsch, and the other one is the word ghetto, actually in a, with a positive spin. Okay, so I just wanted to issue that warning so that, you know, children and other, others are, yeah, okay, good. Uh, so, third caveat, and then maybe I'll say something, um, is that you, you, you actually, speaking of meta, you also referenced uh, two exhibitions that I curated here at the Magnus, so there is that too. So I'll, I'll say something about one right away, because I think it brings us straight into part of what we were, you were covering. So let's see if I can get to this right away. But the, the uh, exhibition that's next door on Mendelssohn and that displays the, the this painting that you should see behind me is a very interesting primary example of the museum effect. We are in the, this is a mid 19th century painting, the same Moritz Oppenheim that you quote in terms of the museum goers and, and, and we're in the, in the study of Moses Mendelssohn and the study is populated by all of those little objects that the poem by Leilis that you mentioned at the beginning of your, of your paper are listed. You know, we have, look, we have like a, a ritual lamp, a biblical inscription, we have even tzitzit coming out of uh, Moses Mendelssohn under Moses Mendelssohn's coat, uh, we have a kippah here, you can't really see it in the reproduction and even in the painting it's hard to see but there is a mizrah. Uh, there are all these, all these elements that populate uh, this painting and then in a way sort of turn the painting itself in some kind of a Jewish museum without the facility, without the, without the, without the space, just only, only the canvas. And it's interesting that this is a mid of the 19th century which is a moment of mourning of the loss of uh, of the ghettos, of the loss of, of, of traditional uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish culture. So in a way, Mendelssohn's study becomes a ritual space of memory and history. And we see this very much embodied in this uh, painting. Now the question is, is the objection to the museum effect in the, in the poem that you quoted at the beginning, uh, is it an objection to the museum or is it more of an objection to Jewish art or Jewish aesthetics per se, because there is a there is sort of like this sense that uh, putting together Jewish things one next to the other is is inappropriate. It's, it's, it, there is a sense of loss, uh, loss there, and in a way, to me at least, it's it's what it act, what it actually this is addressing is the somewhat inherent dimension of kitsch mm -hmm. that both Jewish art and Jewish museums. Uh, face in a very constructive way. There is a mandate, the mandate of telling the entire history of the Jews, right? Which, depending on which museum you go to, well, it typically begins with Abraham. There seems to be a general consensus with that. But if you go to New York, it culminates, that Jewish history culminates in, in New York City. If you go to Los Angeles, it culminates in Hollywood, uh, etc. right? If you go to, to Tel Aviv and the Jewish diaspora, the culmination of Jewish history is, of course, uh, the state of Israel and, and Zionism and, and so on. So there is, there is a kitsch, by kitsch I mean a discrepancy between aesthetic goals and means, and artistic means, where the artistic means cannot ever justify these higher goals that are being, uh, that are being attempted to be attained, right? Uh, so it's, I'm wondering whether the, the, the problem there is really with museums or it's more with a topical representation of something that escapes any type of, of topical representation. Okay? I have and an answer for you, but I'll wait for you. Thank you. 
And in a way, it's also about, and I think it emerges very clearly in, in your paper, at least from my vintage point, a, a conversation, a dialectic, and a conflict, too, uh, between experience and life. It, it comes in your, in your paper, and I think it's very much about what we all do when we go to a Jewish museum or to a museum. What, how much it, of it is life, how much of it is experience, is it a real synagogue, not a real synagogue, is it a, you know, what, what, what is this space and, and what are we uh, prompted to do? And, uh, you know, to be just academic for a second, I think that actually Walter Benjamin and his evolving notion of, of, uh, of experience could come to the rescue here mm -hmm. because he eventually points to a notion of experience that is pre-illuministic, so predates the, the earliest museums that you were uh, mentioning, and in a way pre-logic. It's about an experiential experience of a lived life that is in the doing, the same doing that we saw in the teaching through building the roof, mm -hmm. right? And that we do here in teaching through making an exhibition, through handling objects and trying to find connections among them. So the other exhibition that you were quoting, The Future of Memory, mm -hmm. was actually an exhibition about what happens to us when we negotiate between the analog and the digital. And the visitors there were actually our students who were populating it and doing their work and, and navigating this conflict between the, the analog objects uh, and how they are stored in a, in a collection storage and brought out and studied and researched. And uh, you know, I've learned to say we do not put collections online. I learned this from, from my son years ago when he was little and he did something cute and I said, oh, this is so cute, I'm gonna put you on YouTube and he looked at me scared and he said, you mean I'm not gonna be with you and mama anymore? <laughs> so we do not put anything online, right? We, we, th these are surrogates, these are, these are replicas of what goes digitally, right? It's not the, it's not the thing that goes online. We, we keep our children close to us, right? We don't delegate to Mr. Google uh, to do that. Um, so, in other words, the, the museum effect is also this type of experience, which is very much pre-luministic, meaning pre-Kant, pre pre-Newton, uh, pre-certain axiomatic laws of, of, and, and of gravity, that things have to be only one way and predetermined. It's, it's about this opening to, to something that is eventually unexpected, and it's unexpected through its performative uh, aspects. And when we come to performative aspects, one way in which I think you've outlined, and I think also that the comical reliefs of the responses from the audience in your talk today are also about that. It, it's a, a performance is also very much about audience's expectations. So in these terms, and with this I will close my remarks, I'm thinking about what, you know, what is the museum effect, but most importantly, what is the, museum, the Jewish museum as a space for the performance of Jewish cultural acts? And uh, two ways in which I can see the museum as being an extension of other Jewish spaces are one, as an extension of the synagogue. So not just in the case to go back to, to, to this synagogue of a museum that reconstructs the synagogue, reconstructs the synagogue, but really the, the space of the museum as an extension of the synagogue as a, a, a space as it's been defined, a space for prayer, study, and assembly. So a, a very multifaceted space. And then, and this is another possibility of, ex, of seeing the museum as, as extending a Jewish space, is extending the space. And last week, we sort of globally, including New York Times, celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Venice ghetto, from where the word ghetto comes from, right? And uh, an extension of the original ghetto a porous space, not, not, a, not necessarily and only and solely a walled space, which the museum also is, right? It's a delimited physical space with walls and doors that have to close at some point, security, and, and so on, but also a porous space. And as we are getting to understand also in a, in a more mainstream way, uh, these days the Venice ghetto was regularly visited by non-Jews. It was, it, was it was a transactional place. Uh, including its synagogues. Its synagogues were very much public places and their, their displaying of um, aesthetic codes that 
uh, signify the proximity with the world outside of the ghetto, of the churches and so on, similarly to what was being discussed earlier about the, the painted uh, wooden synagogues and their aesthetic relationship with, with, uh, with the churches in the surrounding areas, also signifying this porous space of intercultural, interreligious, interfaith exchange. So I'm wondering whether the museum effect is sort of like a, a, an issue in, 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 in Jewish life, an issue of extending other Jewish spaces pre-existing that brings us back, bring us back to that pre-illuministic experience of Jewish life. So these are my, my remarks and my questions. And I know we will have more from the, from the audience. We do have a microphone here, but uh, the microphone now goes straight to you. Well, thank you. That's, um, there's a lot of food for thought there. I'm just going to say very quickly about the poem. Mm -hmm. Now I can answer quickly. So this is a poem written right after World War II uh, by someone who I think is, uh, is thinking about the, the destruction of Jewish life in Europe, including its material destruction, uh, as well as the human destruction, as well as cultural in, uh, destruction and is thinking about you know, what really endures and that it's not the material world. And in fact, he says, well, the material world, you know, with museums, that's goyim nachas. That's things that, 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 that Gentiles do. That's not where our treasures are found. And I think it's, it is um, a response to the fact that we still have texts, right? So I think that's what's going on there. I, but um, also, I, I didn't read the whole poem, so to be fair. So I'm going to send you the whole poem so you can, you can see for yourself. I did read the whole poem. Oh, you did? Okay, good. You did his homework. All right, good. But I think, I think that that, to me, because of the location of when this is written, and it's written by a Yiddish poet, so who's very tied to, uh, to Eastern Europe, um, that that's, that's what's going on there. But why don't we, should we open it up? Why don't you call on is an open microphone, so if there are remarks and questions, uh, please, yes. Um, yes, we can take them from here and repeat the questions. So, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll hear a few, so please. Okay. I, I'm sorry, I have the light against my eyes, so yes, go ahead, yes. There was an, another closer here, yes, and then another far back. Just one closer here, yes, oh, sir. Yes, I would just, I'd be interested in your answer to the question you asked first about the distinction between Jewish experience and museum experience. <coughs> yes, well, and then one, one more in the back, that yes. That so I noticed that you didn't include any museums in Israel, and I'm wondering if that was a conscious decision, and if so, I'd love to hear articulate why, and if it was unconscious, well, then that would be much more interesting. <laughs> 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 okay, that's plenty. All right. So, um, all right. So, working my way backwards, uh, actually, was conscious choice in that um, what I'm interested in, without making the talk even longer, is uh, a, a diasporic practice, and I think. Um, uh, you know, museums in Israel, whether they're you know the big official museums or smaller uh, museums, they're operating within uh, a, a, a different rubric. And um, I just didn't want to make the talk longer. So uh, to me, it's a, it's a, it's another topic. But I'm I'm glad you mentioned it because uh, I I think one of the things that's at work 
in this practice and also in the questions that have just been asked is um, uh, what, what is the place of museums as, um, uh, as situating Jewishness in space, in a, in a public space, in a landscape uh, where that's contingent in the diaspora in a way that it is not thought of as contingent uh, in Israel, so that that would be my my short answer to your, your question, um, and I think you know this the the, the question of you know uh, you know the, the sorry, what? life and experience life and experience um, uh, as um, I, you know I I I want to think more about your idea. I'm not sure that I think that these experiences are as unmediated as pre-modern as you're suggesting, I think there's a lot of deliberation that distinguishes, let's take you know, the building of the, the, the reproduction of the budget uh, uh, ceiling, it's, um, it's very uh, deliberate, it takes place within an academic framework, um, uh, people are not, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the majority of the participants are people who are not entering a profession, but they are um, being instructed as a, a, a path into not just learning how to, you know, hew mm -hmm. logs or, or um, uh, uh, you know, may do just kind of traditional painting, but as 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 as, as, a, as a path into learning about the past. And so, you know, so that to me, that's very very different. Uh, Thing and I think what your project here also did has a, uh, a deliberateness um, that distinguishes it. Doesn't make it less um, important or valid an experience, but it's just very, very different from how we imagine our, you know, the, these earlier experiences. That's my gut reaction. I need to give it more thought. And I think um, the 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 question of you know. Um, uh, you know, the Jewish museum effect. I don't think there's one because I think when you look at the diversity of Jewish museums, there are a lot of different uh, 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 missions for the museums. And then there are a lot of different publics who have their own idea of what museums should be doing and what, they, what the value of them is. And to me, um, the most interesting thing is when when you spot disparities. So for example, um, people have studied this, th which I mentioned only briefly, uh, what people write in comment books when they, they visit uh, museums. And in particular, um, Mati Bunzel, who used to be an anthropologist but now is running a museum in Vienna, did a study of the comment books uh, in the Jewish Museum in Vienna, which is the you know, latter-day version of what was the first what we think of as the first Jewish museum, first so-called named, you know, Jewish museum, and um, and this was a museum that was either renowned or notorious, depending on where you're coming from, for having uh, a a very unconventional approach to exhibiting um, uh, uh, the history of Jews in Vienna and Jews in Austria. Um, that really tried to break with more conventional uh, practices of how they displayed objects, of how they narrated. And um, so he wanted to see if museum visitors had what to say, you know, pro or con, about the, the, the curatorial approach, because in the museum professional world, that's all anybody was talking about, whether they liked it or not. In the comment books, he said, you know, it just doesn't seem to have made any difference that uh, he said you had two kinds of visitors with two kinds of comments. You had Jewish visitors, mostly from you know, the United States or Israel, who basically used this as an opportunity to validate either the Zionist state or immigration to America because this is what happens to Jews who stay behind in Europe, right? Like totally missing, much of what the curator was trying to do. They were there to validate their own histories. The Austrian and other non-Jewish European visitors to the museum were um, basically using it as an opportunity to uh, atone for the crimes of their ancestors and to say, when we visit this museum, we see what a tragedy it was that European Jews, it's like, 
they're walking into the museum on a mission that is, is, has nothing to do with what the curator has, is setting out for them. And, and uh, I, I think that actually is not an unusual phenomenon when we look at comments. In a way, it comes back to your question about you know, are museums replacing the synagogue? I don't know if they're replacing, but um, they are for, um, for, for a number of visitors, uh, Jewish and non-Jewish sites for affirming the, the ideas they have about Jewishness, whether it's their Jewishness or other people's Jewishness, um, that they bring with them before they've walked into the building. And so that, that to me is uh, one of the most interesting parts of thinking about the, the, the Jewish Museum effect as a practice, that it's a practice for a validation that might have nothing to do with what you're actually going to see in the museum. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Francesca.